a word about um, Uber ATG R&D. So we've got Uber, which I assume everyone know, and then within it we have ATG, which is the Advanced Technology Group. This is the self-driving division for Uber. And then within it there is an office that's based out of Toronto, which is the R&D office by name. It's really a um, um, focused primarily on AI, on machine learning, and really on, on deep learning for um, self-driving. And uh, there's about 60 or so of us, um, a whole bunch of people doing uh, kind of fundamental research, and then uh, a whole bunch of people doing research engineering, which means taking this fundamental research and bringing it to the production systems. Um, a little bit about myself. So I did my PhD in machine learning um, at the University of Toronto. And um, I decided to not go the academic route. I wanted to do industry and uh, primarily work on things that actually, you know, have an impact and, and people can use. Uh, I really like things that are tangible that you can touch. And so I've really worked in uh, looking back at my career. I've always worked on a product that is something uh, physical uh, from uh, computer chips to the Kinect gaming system, Kobo, the e-reader, um, robotic arms, and now at uh, Uber with our big um, Robocar. Um, so why uh, uh, and just uh, Adam is the videos rendering properly given that we didn't uh, get a chance to practice any of that. Yep, it's perfect. Yeah, cool. So why why do we want to do self driving? And meanwhile, I'll show you some of our you know self driving car footage. Um, so obviously, it's uh, it's uh, an important problem because we believe that eventually we can um, reduce life, uh, reduce sorry, reduce reduce casualties, um, reduce congestion in cities um, because we might not need as many spots for parking in this world where we have uh, ride sharing as a primary service um, that's uh, with automated cars. Um, uh, pollution can be reduced, um, road, road kill can be reduced. And so uh, overall, um, we definitely believe that this is uh, kind of the future. Um, it's also a really difficult problem. So this is kind of a rendering of the, uh, the tasks that the self-driving car needs to solve. So we've got the self-driving car in purple, and then it's got to understand the road, what lanes it can be in, what lanes it can turn into. Um, and then it has to understand everything else around it, which includes the um, different cars, uh, pedestrians, which I'm showing here with this uh, little circles and so on. Okay, so how do we go about solving this problem? Well, first thing is um, we need to have a way to see the world. And uh, so this is our current version of the self-driving car. And there is a whole bunch of technology in it to allow us to drive. Um, so we've got this LiDAR on top, uh, this big um, kind of uh, conical shape. So this is a sensor that tells us how far things are. Um, so it gives us a three-dimensional representation of the environment telling us where things are, how far they are. Um, we have a set of cameras. So these are your RGB cameras and they're pointing at different angles and they have also different, um, in general, there are different angles uh, for uh, wide or um, um, narrow angle cameras. Uh, we've got things like radar, ultrasonics and so on. Uh, and there's a whole bunch of stuff happening at the back, um, uh, which is the compute units for, for the car. So just a lot of CPUs, GPUs, cooling systems, and so on, so that we can process everything in real time. Um, the basic problem for um, self-driving is, is actually quite easy to formulate. You basically want to get uh, from sensors to control. So the sensors are our input. Here we're seeing a camera. This is the front wide camera, as well as a LiDAR um, display. That's the blue stuff on the right. Um, which is basically imagine you're looking from above um, and then the, the, the thing in the middle is the self-driving car. Um, so we need to go, let me just play it again. Um, so I don't know if you can see my mouth, but I'm hovering over the, the self-driving vehicle. Um, and we go from this to the, um, so, so from sensors to controls and the controls here are the uh, wheels. So turning it right and left um, and the acceleration deceleration. Great. Um, so how are we thinking about solving this problem? I'm going to skip uh, to the next slide. So um, in traditional autonomy stack, so autonomy is the name we typically give to this problem of going from sensors to controls. Um, we kind of break it down to a whole bunch of sub problems. So the first, uh, and, and let me take you through them. So we've got our sensors and here I'm just showing the LiDAR information again from a top down view. And we've got our maps. 
So our maps are these uh, very high definition maps. They're not like your Google maps, uh, which gives you information about every lane, um, every stop sign, from what lane can you turn to every other lane, um, traffic lights, and so on. And these maps are created by, uh, by Uber ATG. So we go out with the cars and we collect data and we generate these maps. Um, so we have our maps and our sensors and as input. And then uh, the first thing that we try to solve is the problem of perception. So perception um, is basically where is everyone that I care about in this uh, in, in the current um, time step. Um, and this would be all of the dynamic uh, moving things in the scene. Um, so that includes other cars, it includes motorcycles, uh, motorcycles, cyclists, pedestrians, and so on. Um, and we want to know where they are, so that's the task of detection. Um, and we also know want to track them. So tracking means we know um, how fast they're. We're basically able to track them um, time step over time step. So what happens is this this lidar on top um, uh, sweeps around a full 360 every one tenth of a second. So every 100 milliseconds, we get a new image, a new frame like the one we're seeing here. Um, and so we can say here is a detection of a car at time t, and then at time t plus one, there is another detection of a car. And we kind of want to know that it's actually the same car over time, because once we have that information, we can compute things like what is the velocity of the car, which is something that we need to do. So once we know where everyone uh, is and, and how fast they're going, uh, we can also predict where we think they're going to be in the next time horizon. So we can predict where they're going to be at, um, in the next 100 milliseconds, 200 milliseconds, all the way to several seconds worth of prediction. Um, so once we know where everyone is and we know where we think they will be, uh, we can finally plan uh, the trajectory of the self-driving vehicle because um, we need to uh, be able to, you know, to, to use this information about where everyone is and, and, and where we think they'll be um, so that we don't um, bump into other cars, for example. So that's one big uh, type of constraint that we need to satisfy for planning. We also need to satisfy the constraint of not violating any traffic laws. Um, we also need to make sure that the driving experience is actually convenient for the passenger. So even if you know that you can um, execute a maneuver of uh, changing lane by like really slamming on the on the gas and then uh, really slamming on the brakes and you would still be able to squeeze in from a physical perspective, um, that's just not going to be convenient for whoever is in the car. So you need to take all of these things into account. So once you solved for this, then you can pass on this information to the control system and, and you've got your self-driving um, stack kind of in a nutshell. Um, so this is, as I said, this is kind of the, the traditional approach. And um, what's good about the traditional approach is that we get this interpretable intermediate representation. So um, we understand what's happening at every stage of the way. Um, and it's also easy to incorporate prior knowledge. So, you know, in the planning stage, we put all of our, all of the stuff that we know about rules of traffic. Um, the, the cons of, of this approach is that um, each one of these steps is computationally expensive and we're just adding them up. And so eventually the latency of the whole system can become quite large. Um, it's also not very easy to develop in such a system because typically every, every one of these um, you know, perception, prediction, planning, they tend to be entire teams of engineers and they're all working in their own kind of domain. And, um, and then the prediction team, for example, really needs to deal with the decisions made by the perception team um, and the consequence uh, difficulties that it might um, kind of in, like introduce into their workflows because they're really dependent on some upstream process and upstream product. Um, and then when the perception team comes and changes something, maybe the prediction team will need to make a huge change in their stack because you know this thing has a, has a flow to it um, as a pipeline system. Um, and, and one of the biggest problem with this approach is that what you're training is not actually, um, you, you say you're training a perception algorithm, right? Um, the task that you're training it for is not actually self-driving, which is what we really need the whole system to perform. Well, you're training it to detect pedestrians and motorcyclists and cyclists in a frame. Um, now, if the um, what we know from what we know from like just driving is that um, not all cars in our field of view are as important, right? Um, the most important ones are either the one that's right in front of us in the same lane as us or, you know, to our sides, 
or the ones that are coming towards us. Um, and things that are moving faster are more important. Things that are far away or behind us are not as, less, not as important. But when you're training a system to, to do detection, you don't really have a nice way of telling it that you know not all things are created equal. Um, and so what you might think from an engineering perspective is, oh, okay, so I need to start putting some importance weights on, on where in the scene I'm, I'm, I'm uh, detecting objects. And basically what you're saying is I want to learn what's more important, right? And so rather than hand tweak it. And so this is why you'd like the signal to come all the way from the driving itself to, to teach you which what is more important as opposed to trying to put it down in, in rules and, and, uh, and kind of hard coding it. Um, but you don't really have access to this information when you're training your perception system. So what we're trying to build is basically um, an end-to-end -end, um, approach that takes the, um, that takes, uh, the, the benefits of, of having one neural network that we train end-to-end. -end. And, and as I said, this is kind of a problem that really lends itself to, to a machine learning setup because you have input, maps and sensors, you have output, which is you know, the, the control. Um, and you have a lot of examples of how to go from the input to output. Basically, you get these examples by sending people out to drive. So it's actually quite easy to collect labeled data in that sense. Um, so the, the, the benefit of, of using this idea of end-to-end -end systems is that it's a very single, it's a very simple approach in terms of the fact that you have one AI system, you have one neural network, um, and you're training the network for what you actually want to achieve. You're training it for the end task of self-driving as opposed to say just the perception system that you know you don't really know about the end task. Um, there are issues with this approach. Um, it's difficult to incorporate prior knowledge. I mean, where in this like one neural network do you stick the rules of traffic? Um, and you get no interpretability. So let's say that you've trained this huge neural network um, end to end, and now it goes and does something really weird. You have no idea why. Is it because it never was aware of the fact that, say, there is a car in front of it? Or was it aware of the car in front of it, but it didn't predict well where the car was going? Or did it do all these things really well, but the planning uh, stage was flawed? Um, or maybe, you know, because it's a neural network, it's a black box, it doesn't have any notion of this sub component and it's just doing something completely different. So you really can't um, explain what's going on. Uh, and this is a big problem for validation, for safety, um, and for fixing any issues that you come across. So the, the approach we're taking um, is this idea of an interpretable end-to-end -end, um, um, network uh, uh, or neural motion planning is one way of calling it, um, where you're basically doing all of these things in one neural network, but you're also getting these intermediate uh, representations. And so um, because it's one network, you do get the lower um, computational time. Like you can share a lot of the computation. Um, you can incorporate um, prior knowledge because you're kind of forcing the network to have these subcomponents and you can inject them at the right place. Um, it is end-to-end -end trainable, so um, it's easier for people to, to work on it and you don't have these cascading pipeline issues. Um, you get your intermediate interpretable results because that's how you kind of construct the network and you are training everything for the end task. So even if you're training your detector, the, the signal of errors and so on comes from how well is the system uh, driving as a whole. Um, and so in terms of our progress on this problem, um, we, uh, we're working on it from the research perspective uh, as, as, uh, as well as from the um, productive productionization perspective. Um, so right now, the system that we have in the production pipeline does the joint perception and prediction. So we've kind of combined two out of the three components. Um, and this is this is kind of a visualization of our perception prediction, joint perception prediction network. So what you can see here is um, all of the colors uh, indicate that this is a detection and then the lines kind of being emitted from each one of the cars is the prediction of where it's going to be um, in the next um, few seconds. Um, so um, the, the next step is to have all of it um, as one uh, system. And we've published a whole bunch of papers about how to do this um, end-to-end uh, interpretable um, uh, neural network. Um, and I think I'll show you one uh, recent example. So this, this really was just published, um, you know, I think a 
a couple of months ago, if it's that. So this is a network that does, so you can see that it does the detections because we've got these little squares around the cars. It does the prediction. We have these little trajectories from each one of the cars. And it also does the, um, it also does the, the motion planning in the sense that, so you can see the self-driving car in the middle kind of um, planning its route. Um, and one of the ways it's planning it is by also estimating, so these like rainbowy things, um, where are other cars most likely to be? Where is a good place for, for the other cars to, to drive? Um, so just moving on to some other cool stuff that we're doing um, at the lab. Um, one of the things that people often uh, ask about is like, uh, are the cars communicating between each other? So at this point, of course, we don't really have um, a fleet of vehicles that are driving out there, but we hope to have that um, uh, when the time is right. And obviously cars can share information so that the driving is overall better. And, and on the left here, you see um, a really good uh, demonstration of it. So we've got the car coming from the left um, and it doesn't in its field of view see that there is like a little kid that's about to run into the road, but the car on the top can see that uh, little kid. And so um, it can send some sort of information to the um, car to tell it, you know, there is a pedestrian there that you that you know is occluded right now from your point of view, but I can see it. So so take um, take that into account. So the big question about um, this type of technology, um, so vehicle to vehicle, is what is the information that you're going to be sending? Because you can send, um, for example, one one simple solution is to say just send the detections, right? Um, so uh, so it's very uh, limited in scope um, and it doesn't give you the full information, but it's um, it gives you perhaps the most important information. Um, the other thing you can say is you can say, oh, just send me everything that you see. Just give me like, don't tell me in what coordinate in space there is something. Just show me the image itself that you're seeing and let me do my own uh, processing of it. But so so it's more full, you know, like, for example, um, maybe maybe the car um, is misdetecting something, but um, but with all of the visual information, everyone will be able to more correctly do the detection. So you're not losing any information in the transmission, but also it's in terms of the the amount of network you need to trans like you need to transmit more information over um, the network, which is obviously you know wireless. So um, so that becomes maybe too computationally or, or um, from a transmission point of view, um, it. It's, it's it's too much and also computationally in terms of having to deal with all that much more sensor information for the car to process. So um, so this work is really about like how do we get clever about what kind of information we are um, we're transmitting and on the right here what you're seeing is basically um, we've got like these four um, self-driving vehicles and they're all kind of sharing information amongst them and you can see the the visualization that they're getting each one individually by um, augmenting some of their um, native information with what they're getting from the other cars. Um, another thing that's super critical for systems like ours is to be able to properly test them and um, although we have our own kind of track where we do um, on-road physical testing. Um, we also want to be able to, before we go out to the road or to our track, to do a lot of um, off-board um, simulation um, as a way of, of basically testing our product. And um, in order to do that, you need to have a really, really good simulation, simulation system. And that's one of the things that we're working on. And one of the big uh, questions in proper simulations is how do you, um, simulate sensor information. So sensor information, in this case, we're showing you some um, work that we've done on simulating LiDAR information. Um, and once you simulate LiDAR, you can um, you can basically create uh, scenarios that are much more challenging than what you might have from your existing data captures. Um, and they have the correct sensory information so that you can really test your system end to end. Um, most simulation systems don't actually work like that. What they do is they assume like a perfect world um, that is like artist based, artist rendering based, and um, they use techniques for simulating the sensor information based on um, based on that simulated world, but um, we don't believe that these simulations of sensors are good enough. So our sensor simulator is based on learning how to simulate information from real data. Um, 
Okay, and then um, a little bit of preliminary work on camera simulation. So here, you know, it's pretty obvious which car is simulated, but the important thing is here is that, again, like the environment is completely real and photorealistic as a result. And so you're not suffering, like you're training your network on something that is real. And also the car itself is uh, primarily based on non-simulated, non-artistic, non rendering um, type of visualization. Um, and we're still working on things like, you know, the shadows and all of that, but um, this allows us to really rapidly develop challenging simulations that are photo that are realistic from the point of view of the uh, neural networks. And so, because um, the real problem with simulating these things by artistic rendering is that the information is not actually um, what you see in the real world. It might be very convincing to you as a human looking at it, um, it's like one of these video games, but it's actually very different in terms of its physical properties. And so it doesn't translate well to train a, a system on a fully simulated environment and then take it out um, to the real world. So we really are pushing on this area of, um, of realistic simulation of sensor information. Um, I'll just touch briefly on some of the challenges that we're seeing when we're taking um, research to engineering. So, um, and that's effectively my team. So, so the way we structure our office is we have a team of researchers who are basically working kind of in isolation outside of the production system. And then whenever we think that there is an algorithm that's really ready for production, um, then my team, which is kind of like the connective tissue between uh, pure research to pure engineering kicks in and we help take these models into production. So it's people who have a lot of um, background in machine learning as well as software engineering at production level. Um, so some of the challenges we have are things around, first of all, the data um, wrangling. So we have um, tons of, of data. It's very complicated sensor data. So, you know, the LiDAR and the cameras and all that, the maps, the labels. So bringing it all together so that you can create effective training sets for the neural networks. Um, runtime and performance optimization. So um, mostly runtime is an interesting area because everything has to work really, really fast like fast. As I said, every 100 milliseconds, you kind of need to start computing everything all over again. And so how do you get your neural network um, and all of the pre-processing and post-processing to run um, so effectively is something that requires a lot of um, a lot of effort across anything from what kind of hardware you choose to how do you um, how do you make changes in your neural network architecture so that you get similar results but it's much faster? Um, how do you use things like uh, custom CUDA kernels to do all sorts of computations efficiently on the GPU as opposed to on the CPU even if it's not part of your neural network? Um, how do you use things like um, the, the numerical representation of the weights in your network. So basically like how many, how many numbers do you need to represent your network? So, and using lower precision. So, so we do a lot of that stuff. Um, and uh, maybe I'll touch upon a couple of other things from this list. So um, the, the compute and storage um, deep learning infrastructure. So again, because we do really so much um, data and the training um, is, is, you know, is such a big um, part of, the, the engineering challenges that we have to deal with. We had to build all sorts of custom solutions to allow for effective use of our GPU cluster. Um, for So an example would be you kind of always want the GPUs to be working hard um, because um, they're very expensive and you want them to be fully utilized. Um, that means that if you're training a network, you want to saturate them, to, to keep them as the bottleneck, um, which means, for example, that you want to be fetching your data really quickly. Um, so how do you fetch data fast um, when it's for training a neural network? So um, all sorts of of standard engineering solutions uh, don't necessarily work. Uh, I won't get into the, the details of why, but we've built um, tooling around that these types of uh, problems. Um, and another question that we we had we deal with a lot is how do you, when you have a model and you see that it's working better than what the previous model is, um, how do you make sure that this whole thing, when you put it inside a production system and it's like the full system, not just this one algorithm, um, how do you know that the full system is actually doing better? So that's like the system level testing and, and metrics. Um, one last thing that I want to call out because I happen to think that it's cool is that we have um, in our lab um, an all female leadership. Uh, so, so you can see here my boss uh, Raquel, who is a professor at UFT, 
the co-founder of the Vector Institute and um, um, and the head of the of ATG R&D as well as the chief scientist for um, for Uber ATG. Um, so myself, uh, who's leading the engineering to production effort for R&D and uh, and our technical project manager. Um, and so it's actually I think probably and then on the left we also have our program manager and we're all women um, and we think we have the best uh, self-driving lab in the world um, and. Um, we also, I don't think that there are other places that um, that have like an all-female leadership team, but actually Canada is, uh, in general, in terms of um, female leadership is pretty awesome. There is a lot of, um, a lot of the, the AI labs are led by, by women. I'll call out a few. So the NVIDIA lab, the, the NVIDIA AI lab in Toronto is, um, um, is led by Sonia Fiddler, also a U of T professor and a Vector co-founder. Um, in Montreal, we've got DeepMind, uh, uh, that's led by Duina, Prickup, and uh, and Fair, so the Facebook AI research uh, group, uh, led by Joel Pino. Um, and then we've got a whole bunch of um, of other women, uh, so the Omnia Lab for Deloitte. Um, and um, and at the Vector Institute, there is about 20% of the faculty is women, which might not sound like a lot, but it's actually quite um, unprecedented. Um, RBC's uh, Borealis is led by Fatini, a woman. So I think Canada is really um, doing awesome in this area. So that's uh, another reason that I'm uh, pretty proud to be part of this. Um, and again, happy International Octopus Day to everyone. Uh, um, how far away? How far away are we realistically from seeing self-driving Ubers in Toronto, or across Canada? Oh, wow. really? Self. Well, okay. Um, usually, people ask about self-driving cars in general. Um, Ubers in Toronto. Um, the real answer is I don't know. Um, and yeah. I think anyone who gives you like a date and uh, a number <laughs> is speculating and they may or may sure. not be right. Um, yeah. I, I personally think it's a bit irresponsible to call out a particular um, timeline. Yeah. Um, I think we know that the problem is, is hard. Um, I think we know how to solve it for particular areas, particular weather um, situation, time of day, um, you know, traffic type of um, situations, but we can't currently deal with all of the the long tail of issues that come out at self-driving. And, you know, Uber has been kind of, uh, it was doing incredibly well until we had um, the accident in Tempe a couple of years ago. And since then we've kind of, we took like a long, a long look at, to say, how can we increase our safety protocols and be really, really um, conscious about it and we've kind of slowed down in terms of um, like instead of trying to rush to be the first we we want to be the safest right mm -hmm. um, and you know the reality of it is I think we're gonna see more and more self-driving uh, competition out there but my guess and it's a guess is that everyone every one of these companies is gonna go through this like event where there is some terrible accident and um, and they're gonna have to kind of stop and look at uh, everything they're doing and how do they really ramp up the level of safety testing and procedure that they have as part of their like inherent um, roadmap. And, um, and, and Uber has been publishing a lot of kind of white papers and, and suggestions for the industry to take as best practices. So at least we're learning from that. I, I suppose, you know, looking forward to the future when the Ubers are self-driving and all that. That that uh, that software is that going to be available to a consumer market? And technically, could you once that software is available, would it be possible to kind of link it up to your average Joe and Jane automobile? Um, so instead of having to buy like a, I know Teslas have that uh, self-driving uh, function. Uh, yeah, curious to get your thoughts on that. So I think it's it's quite complicated from a pragmatic point of view because um, because of the sensor technology and all of this stuff, all of the hardware that sits on the car that allows for self-driving, um, you're going to have to rig that up. Mm -hmm. And so while it's definitely kind of a, a, a dream and an aspiration to have generic software that maybe can be um, licensed or, or used by third parties, the reality of how tightly linked the software and the hardware are right now. So even if you went and, and bought um, you know, LIDARs and cameras and hook them all up and had all of that compute in the back, um, 
then um, if it's not precisely the setup that we have at Uber, it's not going to work. And that's true for each one of the self-driving um, uh, offers out there. It's, it's, the systems are still too, I think, young to have this level of abstraction and gener gen you know, generalization. Mm -hmm. But you know, I'm thinking short term, maybe in the, in the much longer term, all of these things, you know, it's, it's kind of like any um, any technology as it matures and there are bodies that govern the uh, protocols and, um, and standardization, uh, then we might be able to get to a point where we can do that. It might sound like a bit of a, a far-fetched in the clouds. There's a little bit of a pun coming here. Uber self-driving airplanes, is that like at all possible, do you think? Is is that something that you, you that the business is working on, or are we we have to get the self driving cars first before we kind of look look to the skies? So there is the Uber Elevate initiative, which is basically looking at that. Um, is it going to happen? When is it going to happen? I don't know, but I hmm. I think it's pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it's already Uber's already kind of on it. They've got some little program inside so you already beat me to it so it's not it's not as a not as, not as a far-fetched idea as i thought uh that's also i think look companies like uber and google um you know certainly innovating and and it's up to these types of uh you know huge enterprise tech businesses to to um drive us forward i think innovation you know comes from from businesses like this and i'm super excited to see what's happening out of the atg uh, and, and i'm totally for that that group and the culture there all, all the women and the work you guys are doing it's awesome and uh, put, really putting canada on the map i think um in that ai space for sure um philip has asked uh, how much power does the lidar systems use do you think you will uh no longer need the lidar system eventually if so when Okay, so if you're for power, if you're talking about actual, you know, watts, um, I don't know. I am not a hardware person. Um, will we eventually not um, need them? So I think the hope is to not need them because they are a pretty expensive piece of technology, um, and they make it such that it, it takes it away from being a consumer product. Now Uber doesn't care about that per se because you know we're going to have our own fleet. But I think for people who want to buy. Um, their own self-driving car. That's that's like a, an an expensive addition to to the bottom line. Um, the reason that most companies use it is because it's the safest option. So we we know that. Uh, so again, we need the lidar to determine how far um, things are. Um, you can do it through um, camera, or or more precisely through several cameras. So you're using the the fact that you have multiple cameras in order to compute how far something is algorithmically. So this is the depth estimation problem that you can do it with two cameras. This is how we know, like we have two eyes and we use the mismatch between what we see in order to compute um, how far things are. Um, but a LiDAR detects it directly. Um, and every time you go through an algorithm, you add another kind of uncertainty and ambiguity to, to your measurements. And uh, most self-driving companies feel like this is an unnecessary risk. Um, that being said, we're obviously working on technology that will eventually help us, um, you know, consider um, whether it's really crucial to have a LiDAR or not. Tesla doesn't have a LiDAR, but Tesla also is not um, currently doing the full self-driving. They're doing like assistive te technology in the sense that in all sorts of situations you can do it, but in many other situations you can't, and you're supposed to sit behind the wheel and pay attention. Yeah, there was a story recently about that guy who fell asleep behind his uh, his Tesla, wasn't he? And he got he got pulled over. Like, mate, you can't you can't just sleep in yeah. your car. You got to you still got to yeah. keep your hands on the wheel, kind of thing. So yeah, I thought that was really really funny. Um, all right, thanks for that, Philip. And another one from Philip. I love it. Uh, he said, "Do you mind telling us a little more about how your labeled data set look? Uh, how is the data stored?" Sure. So. Um... So we label um, the LiDAR information, we label the, um, so let's, let's talk about, let's talk about the camera data. Like I can't label all the information obviously, but let's talk about camera labeling. So um, you decide, um, so I'm going to keep it relatively high level. So you decide on a certain um, a sampling frequency, you're not going to label every single frame. Um, and then you have to decide on a policy. So what exactly does it mean when I say label every person in an image, right? Um, if the person is occluded by something, is there a person there or not? Uh, are, you, are you marking 
you know, where the person you know is or just what you see of the person. Um, and so all of these things are, they, they fall under the, the policy and we have pretty complicated and comprehensive policy documents. Um, and then, you know, you need to decide, are you going to label a person by a, a bounding box or are you going to actually, you know, do the outline? And again, um, one is obviously fast, one is obviously more accurate. Um, you can start thinking about using um, the results of trained algorithms to simplify and um, and expedite the more expensive type of labeling. So you can have like a human in the loop kind of um, solution. Um, and then um, this this is all obviously stored in some form of a, a you know a data storage solution with um, efficient indexing, so that when I want to um, go and fetch a particular label, I can I can do that. And then how, how you index it is up to, I guess, what you're, so this is like kind of the design of the system. So in our case, we, we work um, a lot with the idea of logs. So this is like one unit of consecutive um, images that we've captured at some point and, and maybe we chop it up and maybe we say, okay, each one of that, you know, um, segments um, of however many seconds is one unit of um, of, uh, of access, and then within it, I can access some particular, um, all the sets of images that were labeled um, in, in that particular sequence. Um, so that's roughly, roughly speaking, like in terms of the actual underlying, you know, data sets, data structure, some of it is proprietary, some of it is just using, you know, existing uh, technologies. Thank you. And Mara, it's a, another good question, Philip. And we got another one from Philip. Uh, in what language frameworks do you code the neural networks? Yeah, so primarily PyTorch. PyTorch, nice one. Short and sweet for that one. Uh, and it uh, looks like uh, Philip's final question. So thanks for, for being so engaged with this talk today, Philip. Uh, he's asked, uh, what level of safety is acceptable about Uber? Uh, how much safer do you have to be than a human driver? Yeah, these are incredibly important and uh, difficult questions. Um, I don't know that we currently have a particular number that we're targeting. There is just a lot of policies and things. It's more it, it, like one of the things that Uber has also kind of proposed is here are the set of types of challenges that you need to basically pass. So, you know, like yeah, a system needs to show that it can pass all of these different situations different types of intersections, different types of, you know, um, uh, let's say like vehicles that you need to deal with that um, are obeying the laws, vehicles that are not obeying the laws. So you kind of, you can write like this list of, these are scenarios that you need to be able to um, safely uh, navigate and showcase that you can pass each and every one of them. So that's kind of our metric, like this list of scenarios and a lot of variations around them and being um, like having to pass each and every one of them when we do our offline and online testing. Um, the second uh, question was um, of how much safer do you need to be than a human driver? So that's that's an interesting question because it's not really, we don't, I don't think we know exactly how safe human drivers are. I mean, it varies. But what we do know is that there is a public opinion piece here, which is, um, um, which is, let's say that I told you that, um, you know, I can uh, give you a car that drives, um, that will make half the mistakes a human does, right? Um, this means it's still going to kill people, right? It's going to kill half the people that humans do. And that's not really acceptable to most humans or any human really. Um, and so theoretically it should be perfect, but the idea of, of perfect, it's going to take a long, long time to get to that level. Uh, maybe it's impossible because, you know, there are some situations where you like simply cannot correct for. Um, and as we try to get to um, perfection, a lot of people are getting killed unnecessarily by other people, right? Uh, because maybe if we did have this 50% better self-driving vehicle, we would not have as many casualties. So I think we really need to go through this exercise of having people think this through so that they realize that um, it's okay to have a world where, you know, in part of your um, regular reports of accidents and casualties, some of them are done by self-driving cars. And until we get to that point where it's acceptable, um, we're basically gonna have to wait until we're perfect. And meanwhile, a lot of people die unnecessarily. So, so to me, it's more of like public 
awareness and understanding and thinking through this so that they allow for non-perfect uh, self-driving solutions. Yeah, two things I want to kind of piggyback off that. I think it kind of comes down to, to the ethics and the, the kind of consumer understanding of, hey, we've got these self-driving cars and, um, you know, it, it, yeah, super interesting there. One other thing I wanted to say too, I think the biggest test for a self-driving car is going to be how far it gets around the Nürburgring. Uh, if there's any car fans out there, the Nürburgring is this giant track in Germany, I think it is, and it's the, the test of, of a car's performance. But uh, anyway, I'd like to see an Uber racing car one day. Uh, the final question we've got uh, looks to come from Ali. Uh, he asked, uh, I was wondering how you handle relations of different team results in the end-to-end -end approach among different teams. For example, the prediction team results will affect the planning section of the network. Uh, let's kind of break this question up into a few things. So he said he's wondering how you handle the relations of different uh, team results uh, in the end-to-end -end approach among different teams. Uh, for example, the prediction team will not affect the planning section of the network. How do you deal with these problems? So I'm just reading it to the end and it says in the traditional approach, it was easier because of independency between different teams. So I would argue it's harder um, and it's harder because um, what you do in the perception team affects the prediction team, but they're completely isolated. And so um, not completely isolated, but um, okay, let me, let me, um, let me, let me step back. Um, Let's say that you are um, part of the motion planning team um, and you want certain things to happen. Uh, you, you want certain um, information to pass from the prediction team. Um, your only option is really to go to them and ask them to, to do that. And then they may or may not put it on their roadmap and then you're waiting for it. And maybe the, the stuff that they're outputting because they don't really know that much about motion planning ends up not being that relevant for you. Um, so there is like this, this independence also means that the handshake is weaker between the teams, whereas we're basically thinking, oh, it's like one group of people working on this network. So um, so that should um, alleviate, and, and, and we also think that it might not require as many um, people to, to work on this because it is at the end of the day one network.